Everybody knows that one of the big problems we've been facing in real estate for a long time has been a shortage of inventory. Well, inventory is starting to come back. In fact, inventory is up 21% year over year, according to the most recent Realtor.com data. However, one thing a lot of people have been doing is turning towards new construction as a savior, okay? We're gonna buy a new house because there's plenty of those available. I think last time I checked, there's like eight or nine months supply available of inventory of brand new houses for sale. So no shortage of those. And you've heard the horror stories of people buying brand new houses and they end up you know, having a bunch of problems with the house, you know, and they can't get it fixed. They try to make warranty claims and the builder's nowhere to be found after they end up buying the house, right? Well, that's only half the set of problems when it comes to buying a new house because the other big hidden issue that a lot of people are completely oblivious to until it's too late is how much their property taxes are gonna go up when they buy that brand new house. I did a video about a week and a half ago something like that, talking about how 75% of people who purchased a home in the last few years have buyer's remorse on some level, and property taxes is actually the largest gripe with people who bought houses, okay? People did not think that they were gonna see their property tax bills jump to where they have, but it's actually even worse for people that buy new construction houses. See, the problem is when you buy a new construction house, the property tax bill you see is only an estimate of what it's gonna be. It's not the actual bill that you're gonna see once you buy the property. And let's say, for example, you already stretched to the max, you already you know, have a 40, 45% debt to income ratio, already maxed out your down payment for the house just barely to get in, just to barely afford it, or let's say even you could comfortably afford it, doesn't really matter. Once you actually get your property tax bill and it ends up being thousands of dollars higher than you expected it to be, now it's like, hmm, what do you do? And this is a huge problem because brand new houses literally make up about 30% of the entire housing market right now. So one third of people buying a home are gonna face this issue in the near future or are already facing it right now. And so here's where people get caught up with paying a lot more property taxes than they initially anticipated. Because when your mortgage lender goes to calculate you know, your, your loan and how much you're gonna pay, they obviously are calculating your mortgage, your insurance, and your taxes, as well as your interest payments. But if you're buying a brand new house, the lenders will often use an older tax rate that's an estimated tax rate to calculate the owner's monthly payment, which can be dramatically off. And so this hits people on both fronts because when you buy a brand new house and you come up short on the property tax bill, two things are gonna happen. The first thing is you're gonna have a shortage in your mortgage escrow account because all along as you were making your payment, there was not enough money being escrowed away for you to actually make the property tax bill payments. So you're gonna to have to come up with an extra, the overage, whatever it is, right? But then you get smacked on the other side of the face too, because now your monthly payment will go up from there after that in order to account for your higher tax bill moving forward. So number one, you gotta come up with a lump sum down payment for that extra tax. And number two, your mortgage payment's now gonna be higher. See guys, nice neighborhood. Saturday afternoon, this is what you're hearing over here. Jackhammers, how lovely. Just trying to relax behind the pool in your mansion over here, you just paid $10 million for. You're here in the construction site next door. And the other thing that shows you is your mortgage lender, your broker, whoever it is, is not actually giving you an accurate picture of what your mortgage payment's gonna be in a year or two after buying the property. They're just calculating if you can afford it based on right now. And that goes, that goes for existing homes as well, guys, because it's not just people who buy new construction that are seeing their tax bills double or triple. But if you do buy new construction, you are the most likely candidate to see that happen. And there's only really a couple of ways to figure out what your real property tax bill is going to be. The easiest way would be to look at, you know, similar properties in the area and uh, especially ones that were sold for similar price and see what their property tax bills are. But you got to make sure that they've owned the house for at least a year because if they just bought it within the past year, the property tax bill you're seeing is probably refle reflected from the previous owner's purchase price, not the new one, which I show you guys all the time here on my walks. Check out this duck.
just relaxing by the golf course. But the only real way to figure out what your property tax bill is going to be is to check your local millage rates and find out what the assessed value of your property is going to be. But the problem is if you're buying a brand new house, you don't have anything to base your assessed value on. So really you're kind of shooting in the dark, unfortunately, when you buy a brand new house and you just have to estimate guys, you know, like one rule of thumb I give people here in Florida when they buy and, and not everywhere, but here in Miami for sure is, you know, take whatever the purchase price is and multiply that by about 1.8 or 2%. And that's gonna give you a pretty rough idea of what your new property tax bill is gonna be. If you have a homestead exemption, it's gonna be closer to the 1.8%. If you don't have homestead and it's an investment property, definitely closer to the 2%. Here we have a house for sale for 3.25 million across the street from the golf course. And if you see a couple of the pictures there, this house is largely in original condition. And that's because the owner is actually the original owner. They bought this house back in 1975. I have no idea for how much the tax roll does not say. The property is currently in a trust, but they've already cut the price from 3.4 million down to 3.25. And look at that property tax bill barely even five thousand dollars for a house that's supposedly worth three million and you know the sad thing is is this house is an original condition for the most part you don't see too many houses like that in miami anymore and sadly they're probably going to knock it down and turn it into one of these mega mansions like all the other neighbors are doing so welcome to the future people now another thing to look out for is areas where you're starting to see inventory pick up the most are areas likely where there's a lot of baby boomers that can afford to sell and buy another house. Most baby boomers don't actually have a mortgage and the ones that do likely have a much lower mortgage payment than anybody today or it's actually mostly paid off and they can afford to unload that house and move up to a new house. In fact, the recent 21% increase in inventory that we've seen year over year as largely in markets where a lot of older people are selling their homes. They say about 14% of people in the silent generation who are above the baby boomers and 17% of baby boomers are not affected by the lock-in effect with mortgage rates whatsoever, meaning they own their home in cash and can likely afford to go ahead and purchase their new home in cash, or even if they, they won't purchase in cash, they can afford the mortgage payment on the new home. And to compare that to millennials, only 6% of millennials don't have to worry about the lock-in effect. So you can see there's a pretty big discrepancy there. So the areas where you're seeing the most inventory tick up and where this is happening are places like in Detroit, Michigan, Cleveland, Ohio, Oklahoma City, Buffalo, and Pittsburgh. And it's so funny because in this same story, they constantly talk about how because interest rates are high, you know, the lock-in effect is keeping a lot of people from listing their properties. Like, I do think more people will list their homes for sale if mortgage rates drop to the low fives, guys. But the thing is, listing your home for sale and still having people out there who are able to afford to buy it are two different scenarios. And I think that's where my opinion differs from a lot of people on this. Like I showed you guys the other day in my video, I gave you a perfect example of how even if mortgage rates were to drop down into the mid fours, it would still be unaffordable for the vast majority of people because the prices are still too high. And so while lower rates may entice more people to put their homes on the market, who's going to buy them? A lot of people say, oh, BlackRock will buy them, Open Door will buy them, all these guys are going to buy them. No, they're not, guys. They're not going to buy all these houses. You know why? Because they don't buy properties they can't turn a profit on. And all these houses are too expensive to actually turn a profit on. So that's why they're not going to buy those houses. They might buy some of them, but they're definitely not going to buy them all. But you know where people can still afford to buy, and I've mentioned this before and I will mention it again, is the Midwest, guys. In fact, Zillow just did a list of the top cities for ho first-time home buyers, and half of them are in the Midwest. Uh, St. Louis is the best U.S. market for first-time home buyers in 2024, and Four other cities in the Midwest, Detroit, Minneapolis, and Kansas City, are also located in the Midwest, which are great for first time home buyers where you can actually still afford a house without having to give up half of your paycheck each month. And then the other cities that are not in the Midwest that are still affordable are Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, 
San Antonio, Texas, Birmingham, Alabama, and Baltimore. Yeah, watch out for that last one. And then they put Austin, Texas on the list. I don't know how that made it to the list, guys, because buying a house there is still prohibitively expensive. So I don't know what they're talking about. Maybe because it's based on local incomes. Maybe people can afford it, but still renting there is like so much cheaper. Anybody who buys in Austin today is probably a fool. They say St. Louis is great because affordability is still there. You know, median home price, according to Redfin, is still only $205,000. The share of listings that are on the market today that the median income family can comfortably, comfortably afford is 67%. So that means, you know, two thirds of the houses for sale in St. Louis, Missouri are still affordable for the average buyer, guys. That's just, you don't have to be a superstar, just making the regular income for the area, you can still afford it. And of course, affordability means you're spending less than 30% of your gross income on the house payment. So that is very affordable. They say it's even great for renters in these regions because you know the average renter in St. Louis is only paying about $1,300 a month in rent, which is 34% below the national average of $2,000 a month. But I just wonder how many people are gonna move to these areas. Like so far, it seems like the Midwest is on fire. If you look at what's happening right now in most of the Midwest, those are the markets that I'm bullish on the most as far as home prices not going down, guys. The inventory is still very low in these areas. You know, most of these Midwestern towns, you're seeing still price growth anywhere between five to 10% year over year growth in many areas. And it's defying the downturn that a lot of other areas are seeing. And I think it's due to the affordability. The interesting thing is most of these areas are still losing population. You know, their net population every year is still going down. So it's kind of a miracle that prices in these areas are able to sustain. So, you know, let me know, is this something that you guys are willing to do? You know, if you live in California or New York or Florida or Texas, somewhere like that, and you're having a hard time affording a house, would you be willing to move to the Midwest to achieve the American dream, right? I made a video the other day about how the American dream is basically over for most people unless you're willing to move to the Midwest. Now one thing that's been a minute since I've talked about it is how the landscape is changing with real estate agents because of the NAR settlement. And I don't wanna focus much on that, but what I do wanna focus on is a new study that was done that basically determines what buyers and sellers expect from their real estate agents moving forward. This is good for you to know if you're a buyer or a seller or even a real estate agent out there. So the fact of the matter is up until present day right now, about 90% of buyers and sellers still use a real estate agent, guys. That's almost everybody. Very few people go it alone. They say in here that the internet is being utilized throughout the home search and agents remain the most used information source in the home search, followed by mobile or tablet search devices. That goes for buyers and sellers also turn to professionals to price their homes competitively, help market their homes to potential buyers, sell within a specific time frame, and find ways to fix up their homes to sell them for more. And sure, you can go ahead and try to find all this stuff on the internet yourself and do it all yourself, which 10% of people still do, but a lot of people are lazy, guys. People don't wanna do that or don't want to go through this process and they choose to hire a real estate agent. But here's what home buyers today are expecting from their real estate agents in order to feel like they're getting good service, especially once they have to start paying commissions out of their own pocket, if that's the case. 61% of home buyers, they want help understanding the process, 58% want them to point out unnoticed features or faults with the property. Those are things you're only going to get from experienced agents so far. Negotiating better sales contract terms, 46% of buyers want. Providing a better list of service providers like home inspectors, 46% want. Improving buyers' knowledge of search areas, 45% want that. Negotiating a better price, 33%. Shortening a buyer's home search, 23% expanding the buyer search area 21%. So the reality is a home buyer could do all of those things on their own, 
but they're turning to real estate agents and relying on them to do it for them because it's something that they do daily. And if you trust your agent and you find somebody knowledgeable and reputable with good experience, they should be able to do all of these without a hitch. Another thing that home buyers said that they really value from their agents is constant communication, especially when they personally call them to inform them of activities that need to be done or those who send them property information and communicating via text messages and those who send them postings as soon as a property is listed or when the price changes or the listing is under contract. So they're looking to you to be the one on top of all of this. And if you're not, and they're the ones who are doing most of the work, then they're definitely not gonna see the value in what you're bringing to the table because in, in their case, you're not bringing anything to the table. Surprisingly enough, sellers are actually easier to please than buyers, probably because not as much actually needs to be done. When you are the seller's agent, you only have one job, and that is to get the house sold. And however you go about doing that is basically on you. The end result's the same for the seller. They could care less. But with a buyer, there's a whole host of things to work out, questions to ask, like they said, expanding their search area, questions about the contracts, et cetera, et cetera. So one thing that home sellers value more than anything else is an agent who can make their home stand out, okay? And stand out, meaning that it looks better than the other listings in the area, more appealing, which is gonna fetch a higher price and get the house sold faster. Now about a third of home sellers today rely on a friend or a neighbor or a relative to find their real estate agent, they basically asking them for a referral. And by the way, anybody who needs a referral who doesn't have somebody to rely on like that, you can always use my link down in the description below. I can get you a referral for free. And we only work with the nation's top most reputable agents. Sellers say that their top criteria for choosing their real estate agent is reputation, their honesty and trustworthiness, and whether the agent was a friend or family member. So the people who get the most listings who are the people who have the closest circles of people who are going to refer them business, essentially. You can see that sellers don't have a big laundry list of things they need from a real estate agent other than the fact that they think that they can trust them and they have a good reputation to hire them. It's actually much tougher to be a buyer's agent which like I said in my previous videos, it's so ironic that the buyer's agent's commission is the one under attack here because they're the ones that work way harder to get the transaction closed, guys. That's the reality of it. But we're not gonna get into all that stuff again because we've already been over it a few times in previous videos. And honestly, I know agents that are on both sides of the camp, guys. Like I know people that are absolutely horrible and barely even speak a word of English and somehow still have a real estate license and can still operate, okay? And then I know other people that are like the picture of professionalism and do everything that I just mentioned on this list and then some for their clients. So moving forward, you need to make sure that you're hiring the right person, especially as the buyer's agent, because there's a lot more work that needs to be done on the buying side than the selling side. So if you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you subscribe to the channel. And if you don't wanna wait for my next video to come out, check out this one on the screen right over here, and I'll see you in the next one.